start today by acknowledging that I'm hosting this call from Larrakia country. I acknowledge the Larrakia people, the traditional owners of the Darwin region. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many countries that people are calling from today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Christabel Darcy. I'm co-convener of the NT branch of the Australian Evaluation Society, along with Dr. Alison Reedy. You wanna give a wave, Alison? <laughs> uh, we're only a small branch. I think we have about 35 members in the Northern Territory, but we do try to host a couple of online and in-person sessions each year. We usually host our seminars online so that we can reach our members in regional and remote areas of the NT as well as to share our NT experiences with the rest of Australia. For people who are in Darwin, we do have an in-person catch up this evening at 5 p.m. at the Trailer Boat Club and we would love to see you. So this session will be recorded and added to the AES YouTube channel. So unless you're presenting, you might like to be on mute with your video off. Please put any questions in the chat and Alison and I will facilitate questions at the end. So today we are talking about developing a monitoring, evaluation and accountability plan for domestic violence in the Northern Territory. And we have two presenters with us today. Anna Davis is the Director of Strategic Policy of the Domestic Family and Sexual Violence Reduction Division in the Northern Territory Government, Department of Territory Families, Housing and Communities. The team leads the development and implementation of whole of government DFSV prevention and response strategies. And we also have Peter Stevenson, who is the Director of Research and Evaluation in TFHC. Since 2021, Peter and a small team have been working across the department's program areas to support evaluation planning. The team conducts evaluations and supports the procurement and oversight of outsourced evaluations. And Peter recently led a review of the framework's first action plan. So please join me in making uh, Anna and Peter very welcome. We're so pleased that you could be here with us today. Thank you both. Thank you very much, Christabel, and um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I want to acknowledge, first of all, that we are sitting on Larrakia country and pay my respects to elders past and present. And we are very lucky to be able to see a little glimpse of salt water from my window here. So that's always nice. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, the women and children who have died from domestic and family violence. Um, and particularly in the Northern Territory. Um, we know that when we're talking about this issue, we often talk about stats and numbers, but these are not numbers. These are people. Um, these are women who's, uh, who are valued members of their families and communities and workplaces, and we um, never want to forget that. Um, so we are very pleased to be able to present today. Um, this is just a brief overview of what we will be covering. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about domestic family sexual violence in the Northern Territory and what some of that um, policy context is and how we have um, endeavoured to uh, plan and implement our policy within our um, government's framework. Um, and then we're going to be talking about our monitoring and evaluation plan and how we developed it and what the impetus behind it was. Um, and then we'll be talking about how that fits into the Northern Territory Government's program evaluation framework um, and going into a bit more detail about <laughs> our monitoring, evaluation and accountability plan, the elements within that, um, and then have time for questions and discussion. So um, for those of you in the Northern Territory, you've probably seen a lot of these statistics already. Um, uh, but for those who are not aware, domestic family sexual violence um, is a huge uh, issue in the Northern Territory as it is nationally and internationally. Um, the Northern Territory has the highest rates of domestic family and sexual violence in Australia. Um, and these rates are increasing over time. Um, the Northern Territory also has the highest severity of violence. And when I say that, I'm talking about homicide rates. So the homicide rates are seven times higher than the national average. And um, the ABS data shows that a weapon was used in 41% of all assaults, which is higher than in any other state or territory. 
um, domestic family and sexual violence is the reason for the majority of Im imprisonment um, in the Northern Territory. So 63% 60, of prisoners are held for domestic family violence related offences. And we know that the vast majority of victims and victim survivors are Aboriginal women. We also know though that domestic family and sexual violence is not intractable, it is preventable. Um, and when we work together and build a coordinated system that is based on the evidence um, we have the possibility to learn from the evidence and to make changes in this space. Um, this is a picture that shows the Northern Territory's um, policy framework and it derives from our international obligations under um, the Convention to Eliminate Discrimination Against Women as well as our national obligations under the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children, the, the um, soon to be released uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander plan and the action plans and also our commitments under closing the gap target 13. So under that national and international framework we have a 10-year Northern Territory domestic family and sexual violence framework um, called safe respected and free from violence um, that commenced in 2018 and the framework has four domains to it. Um, the first one is primary prevention, so focusing on stopping violence before it starts and having a population-wide approach. The second one is early intervention and accountability, um, and that focuses particularly on working with children and young people who are starting to use violence, but also on interventions with um, adult perpetrators. Um, domain three is response, recovery and healing. And domain four, which wraps around all of the others, is having a coordinated and evidence-based system. So these are actions related to systemic enablers and reform. Um, the, all of our framework policy documents are online and there's a link down the bottom there, which I think has also been shared in the chat. The framework itself is a 10-year framework, as I said, and it's implemented through three rolling action plans. Um, the first action plan, 2018 to 2021, is complete and has been evaluated. Um, we are now in the um, process of implementing the second action plan, which is that blue one in the corner there. Um, the second action plan's focus is on taking stock, evaluating and reviewing and building on what works. And it goes for three years. It has 65 actions within it. Um, the actions are allocated across the agencies involved with this work in the Northern Territory. So police, health, education, territory families, housing, attorney general and justice. And our role in territory families, housing and communities is to lead the implementation of the framework and actions as a whole, but also of particular actions um, that are our responsibility and also to monitor um, the implementation across the whole of government. Um, at the start of 2018, when the framework was launched, um, it was very much recognised that a monitoring and evaluation um, approach was required. Um, however, it took us a little bit of time to get to the point where we had a approach formalised, um, which is the subject of this presentation. Um, so in 2022, we started to develop our monitoring, evaluation and accountability plan. And this was done collaborative, co collaboratively across the five agencies involved, um, led by the, our department, Territory Families, Housing and Communities, um, with the support of um, the Department of Treasury and Finance and our research and evaluation unit here within our agency and also with consultation with our domestic family sexual violence sector. The process took around eight months and the final document was released in 2023 last year. And um, one of the uh, important contexts to this was it was in, um, it was part of a cross-agency budget cabinet submission to fund Action Plan 2. So our monitoring evaluation and accountability plan or MEEP um, was envisaged uh, carefully to um, be able to respond to a few different needs. So the first one was it needed to be responsive to a multi-agency, multi-stage and multi-program framework. So this was very complex. As I said, um, the action plans have 65 actions within them 
which are distributed across the agencies. Um, they cover those range of domains and they cover a whole range of different um, projects, programs and um, initiatives. We also wanted this document to not just be something that you know sits on a shelf but has a communication and educative role um, both to those who are using the um, MEEP for their own actions but also for the other stakeholders in the general community and that for us meant it needed to explain why we were doing what we are doing, what our theory of change is in terms of ending domestic family and sexual violence and how we um, how we are committing to get there. Because there are so many different players involved in this space, um, we wanted to be able to use the MEEP to build a shared language and approach and to support consistency and coordination. Um, and we do that by using common language, common processes and shared outcomes across the multitude of different actions um, that the MEEP covers. We know that this is really important because if we don't have a collective approach to responding to domestic family and sexual violence, um, we can um, miss critical opportunities to intervene. Victim survivors can fall through the cracks um, if a system is disparate or disconnected. Um, and most importantly, um, it can become much harder to keep people who are using violence in view of the service system. We want we want the MEEP to be a living document and for it to be flexible um, across the period of time that the framework continues for. It's based on the available evidence, but we know that evidence is always a point in time um, and that particularly in this space, evidence is growing all the time. Um, we are learning more. Um, and unfortunately, one of the ways that we learn is through coronials into the deaths of um, women and children by domestic and family violence. And we want to make sure that the learnings um, that we get through those tragic circumstances are incorporated into our um, evaluation approach. Um, um, the point of the MEEP is also to drive collaboration, sharing, learning and improvement. So, of course, it's about um, our ability to track, monitor and report change and to have a continuous improvement approach. But what's behind that um, for us and what we really value is the ability um, for us to be able to come together and talk about what's working and what's not working, what our challenges are, um, what our learnings are and what our wins are in a way that um, encourages that culture of, of peer review and continuous learning. Um, the MEEP has a very strong emphasis on accountability and in this way it might um, vary from some standard monitoring and evaluation plans um, and we really want that accountability to be front and centre um, and that's because we obviously are accountable for public funding and we want to be very clear about what we are doing with that funding um, but also because we are accountable to victim survivors of domestic family and sexual violence in the work that we're doing and to all of our stakeholders who we're working with. And finally, um, we wanted the MEEP to be able to help us manage expectations and educate um, across the government, across the community sector and across um, communities in general about the pace of change for domestic family and sexual violence. Um, and particularly noting that the MEEP was developed in the context of a budget submission. And I'm sure others are aware of the pressures um, in budget submissions to be able to show um, that the funding is leading to outcomes. We need to be very clear about what outcomes might look like in this space. Um, this is a diagram from Our Watch Counting on Change, which is part of their primary prevention framework. And what it shows and what we also want the MEEP to be able to show is that working in domestic family sexual violence is a really long-term commitment and that there are no quick fixes. It takes collaborative, sustained effort. Um, and really, we need to acknowledge that change is generational. We also need to be very clear about how we measure and define success. And this has been part of our um, development of indicators within the MEEP. So for example, and what this diagram shows is when we are 
doing the job of um, funding services and strengthening our service system so that more victim survivors have opportunities to be able to disclose and to be able to get help. We also know that that inevitably leads to an increase in reports of domestic family and sexual violence. And if we look at that very simplistically, that might look like a failure. It might look like um, funding is going to initiatives, however, rates of violence are going up. But we need to look at this in the long term. And um, what we know is that if we have more services and we have stronger services and we have a broader reach of our service system, if we educate the community and we are challenging some of the drivers of violence, um, then it's actually a success story for increased reporting. What we want to see is the prevalence of violence going down in the long term, but we do want to see the reporting going up, and that to us is a measure of success. Um, the other point that we make within the MEEP is that um, when we understand the pace of change, we need to divide that into short, medium and long-term outcomes so that we can measure our progress along the way um, and acknowledge that while this is a longer term reform journey, we still are able to, um, to show change um, within the, the shorter periods of time. Thanks, Anna. Handing over to Peter now. <laughs> Um, look, yeah, thanks for that. Um, Anna's provided background and context to the development and purpose of the MEEP. Um, as evaluation leads in the department, our role in research and evaluation unit was to support the evaluation planning component and lead development of its associated documents. Since 2020, um, our experience and approach to evaluation planning in NT government has been guided by a whole of government program evaluation framework. The framework, for those who've seen it, would know it's been modelled on a New South Wales government uh, in evaluation framework and their guidelines <clears throat> and is overseen by the Northern Territory Department of Treasury and Finance through their program evaluation unit. Our host, Christabel, as most of you will know, heads up that DTF unit. The framework um, has some general background to monitoring and evaluation, and amongst other things, it sets out the roles and responsibilities for Northern Territory government agencies. Evaluation activity across government is overseen, coordinated and supported through Treasury and Finance, while line agencies such as ours have responsibilities for conducting or commissioning evaluations and reporting to Treasury on their, on their status, the key findings and their implementation. A central premise of the framework and how it's implemented is that agencies commit to evaluating new programs or frameworks in this case, through policy uh, cycles and budget development processes. And the performance and outcomes uh, evidence generated through evaluation must be presented back to government through subsequent bids for budget. The program evaluation framework is accompanied by an evaluation toolkit. Um, this document really expands on the framework and takes agencies through the practicalities of evaluating plan of evaluation planning, commissioning and management, or doing evaluation in agency. Um, it provides templates and guidance for the preparation of two essential documents. An evaluation overview, which is an early budget to be used in the early stages of uh, budget cycle, and a much more detailed evaluation work plan, which needs preparing um, if programs are funded. Uh, it also provides templates and guidance for developing program logics and data matrix matrices. The Program logic template in the toolkit has a fairly standard structure, look and style. Um, and as, as evaluators, we found it easy to work with, uh, particularly as we work with program areas, program leads as subject matter experts in developing out what their program outcomes are. It incorporates colour so that users can easily connect 
output and outcome content in the program logic with corresponding sections of a separate data matrix. For example, references to outputs uh, in the data matrix will be in a pinky red color and medium term outcomes will flow into the data matrix table shaded in uh, a seafoam color. The template also uses arrows to show a causal pathway between activities and outcomes and to highlight crossovers where some outputs contribute to multiple outcomes, where a combination of outputs are needed to achieve one outcome and where there is direct pathway expected from a single output to a single outcome. Um, and it also includes a summary requirement to identify assumptions and external factors that influence the outcomes or their timing. Apart from the assumption, the external factors, there's typically no accompanying explanatory text in a program logic. And that might be appropriate and fit for purpose for our internal works, um, where we're pretty much dealing with the program leads, evaluators, data analysts, and policy officers. But the MEEP, as we've heard, is a public document and its design requirements are for a much wider readership and purpose. For that reason, the existing project logic template on its own was limiting. I'll take you through the features of the MEEPS program, program logic in a moment um, and encourage those who can find the link in the chat to open up the, um, the MEEP um, where you'll probably get a better view of some of the detail that I'm going to um, highlight. Um, you'll see, those who can access it will see it's an accessible and comprehensive document that outlines a theory of change for the framework, the governance and oversight arrangements for implementation, and our approach to evaluation, reporting and communications, as well as those key documents. So compared to the, cool, uh, the toolkit template, we've gone for a different program logic layout. It's small on the screen, and I don't expect you to be able to read the content, um, and it's also a bit of a mashup. So it's I'll just guide you through um, some of the key points. The first thing to note is that the MEEP contains explanatory text throughout. It informs and educates readers of the purpose of the program logic in this case, and guides them on how to read it. It aims to build awareness of what we're trying to achieve through the reform amongst a wide range of stakeholders and helps to create a shared language about the reform. The second variation to the template is the addition of the framework's four domains and the inclusion of the framework's vision framed as an impact statement. Structuring the program logic to include these elements of the framework help the reader connect the activities of the action plans with the framework. And of course, they can follow these through to understand the intended outcomes of those activities. Similarly, the outputs relate directly to the commitments under the action plan. And you can see that they're picked up directly. You can see the action plan numbers um, there's shading to indicate in pink that those are actions that have carried over from Action Plan 1 and that information is provided to the reader. Another point to make uh, about the structure is that unlike the previous format, where cross-cutting and directional arrows are used to show causal pathways, um, to fewer higher order outcomes. This table structure forces the program logic to repeat outcomes common across and within domains. And finally, it's worth raising that as a part of an evaluation plan, a project logic may have to change over time. This will be the case here in a few years time when action plan two closes out and new actions of action plan three need to be overlaid.
Um, again, there's a lot of small words on this slide, um, but I've blown up a couple of the for examples. Uh, these two areas um, of external factors and assumptions are often underbaked and quite generic, particularly in the early stages of program planning. Wherever possible, the MEEP's gone into some detail here to provide highly contextualised and grounded expressions of influencing factors and the assumptions behind the, the logic. Where these are well considered, um, they provide a powerful mechanism for reminding the diverse stakeholder groups accessing the MEEP of the dynamic nature of social reform. They are really important for communicating context, providing insights into how conditions can change, how initial thinking, planning and activity may have to adapt, and, that in, and in that way they do help in managing expectations. Okay, this uh, data matrix, uh, unlike the program logic template, has been lifted straight from the uh, toolkit. Um, but again, you'll see the MEEP. In the MEEP, it's accompanied by explanations of what a data matrix is and how it's to be used. The first section is focused on what we want to know about the delivery of outputs taken from Action Plan 2. The key questions align to outputs and activity and are therefore very process oriented. The indicators, wherever possible, are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. Um, uh, with often the time component captured in the target column. The Data matrix shows that there's many outputs relate, that many of the outputs relate to new programs and reform responses. And as such, baseline is currently not available. We said we wanted the MEET to help build an evidence base. So filling in these data gaps over time will be really important and need to be intentional. That work as well needs to be supported by a systematic approach to data capture and recording and becomes another critical implementation element and one that needs to be monitored through the governance and accountability processes. Key evaluation questions in the section to do with outcomes um, uh, are consistent across the time frame and provide visibility on the outcomes um, we're trying to achieve, as well as the extent and change in outcome over the short, medium and long term. Again, few baseline are in place. Data capture and recording improvements are needed. Um, and the data matrix will need updating as they are established. Evaluation activity will need to draw on and integrate additional sources, such as from occasional surveys and other quantitative and qualitative data specific to each evaluation scope. Now, of course, robust evaluation plays a key part in ensuring we achieve the best outcomes within the allocated resources, and it helps build a contextualised evidence base on what works. Evaluation promotes accountability and a culture of continuous improvement. But we know it's not feasible, cost effective or appropriate to formally evaluate all aspects of the framework. But review is required, particularly of key components. The evaluation plan adopts a strategic approach which includes midpoint whole of framework evaluation. Inclusive of the action plans in 2028. And these are shown in orange. The plan also includes flagship evaluations of key initiatives undertaken as part of action plan one and two, and they're in green. 
I've just popped up here, this is also in the meet, the list uh, of uh, shows the responsibilities for undertaking flagship evaluations and um, being dispersed across the government agencies that lead delivery of those actions. I'll leave them for you to look through, um, uh, but again, they are publicly available, those over time, that, as well as the projections on the years in which they'll take place. I'm going to hand back to Anna now to um, talk about the next phase and close out. Thank you. Um, as I said, accountability is an important part of the meet and um, that includes governance and reporting. Um, this is a overview of our governance um, structure. It's actually more complicated than this, but I've tried to keep it quite high level. Um, we know that domestic family and sexual violence is a very complex problem and that there's no one single standalone system that can take responsibility for preventing and responding to it. So instead we have a multitude of overlapping systems with a broad range of government and non-government agencies working together. And what is so critical is that they work together in a coordinated way. And if they don't work together in a coordinated way um, with a strong governance framework around them, we know that the reforms won't be um, uh, effective. So within our governance framework, we have advisory bodies. Um, as you can see in the red, our cross-agency working group, which includes all government agencies with responsibilities under Action Plan 2 and the framework, and non-government organisation members, peak bodies, um, Aboriginal community controlled organisations as well. We also have a ministerial advisory board um, for um, domestic family sexual violence as it impacts upon Aboriginal people and communities. Within the um, implementation of Action Plan 2, obviously we are the responsible program area. We have created an implementation steering group which brings together the action officers who lead each of the actions under Action Plan 2 from all of the agencies. It reports up to a deputy CEO group and CEO group. Um, so that provides that whole of government leadership and alignment um, that's required. And that reports through to a cabinet subcommittee on community safety, which then brings together those cross portfolio ministers. Um, the minister responsible is Minister Kate Warden, who's the Minister for the Prevention of Domestic Family and Sexual Violence. In terms of reporting, um, and I'll be honest, we're only just starting this, so we're in the process now of pulling together our first quarterly report. Um, but what we're aiming for is um, transparency and accountability because we know that for these reforms to be successful, it's dependent on shared information, reflective practice, collective inquiry, and growing a culture, as I said before, of peer review and continuous learning, um, and of course, being accountable for public investment. So we express this through very clear reporting cycles um, that are um, published and known to, of course, each of the agencies involved, but also to all of our stakeholders. Um, in practice, how this works, as I said, is that each of the actions within Action Plan 2 has an action lead, and each action um, has its own project plan that the action lead is responsible for developing and, and seeking approval for. And that project plan includes a um, project specific program logic and data matrix, as well as um, evaluation proposals. And these are all aligned with the MEEP so that they can fit under those, um, the broader program logic and data matrix that um, Kate has gone through. Each agency has its own executive sponsor to keep that high level leadership um, in place. Each action lead reports quarterly on their progress under their actions and we collate that report, um, we provide it um, to a number of uh, governance bodies but particularly to the CEO Coordination Committee, the Cross Agency Working Group, the Aboriginal Advisory Board and of course the Minister. And every six months um, the reports are made public on the website so that they can be um, viewed by anybody who's, uh, who's interested in that. 
We are also committed to doing an annual report um, for the Minister to monitor the status and implementing all of the initiatives, but also having a bit more of a narrative focus and highlighting the achievements, the areas that might require additional focus and also the barriers and challenges. Um, it's really important to acknowledge that this work has resource implications um, and cannot be done as part of the business as usual. And we are very grateful that within our um, submission, we were able to secure funding for one full-time worker within our um, unit who is responsible for data and evaluation. Um, we're also very conscious that for many of the agencies involved, um, they may not have those resources available to them. Some agencies have evaluation and data expertise within their agency that they can draw on and some don't. So we're also very grateful for the support of our own um, data and evaluation experts within our agency um, who provide support to us, but also where possible support to the other um, partners from other agencies. That's the end of our presentation and we're very happy for questions and comments. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, Anna and Peter, that was um, a really good presentation and I'm going to take uh, the facilitator's prerogative of <laughs> having the first say. Um, you know, it was just, uh, I've really so grateful for taking us through that process of developing um, the monitoring evaluation and accountability plan um, it's such an important thing to share we've already had some comments in the chat about people looking through the resources and and, and uh, thanking you for sharing um, everyone please do put in uh, your questions in the chat we do have a couple um, the one thing I just wanted to point out was um, from my perspective, uh, how important it is uh, that agencies really own their evaluations. Um, and I think that ability to adapt the template to in a way that makes sense for you and your program and your stakeholders and the people that you're communicating to is really is really important. Where you, the, and I, I really admire the way that you've managed to, to keep the key bits that we wanted from a treasury perspective, as well as bringing in the broader perspectives of your very diverse range of stakeholders. So um, yeah, really grateful that it's publicly available and something that we can share with people. I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the eight months that it took to develop it, because I think that will take some people by surprise. I think some people think you can just knock up an evaluation plan in a couple of days. Um, but I think for big programs and complex programs with lots of stakeholders, it can take a lot longer. And I'm just wondering if you could both just reflect before we go to the com uh, questions in the chat around the time frame for developing the evaluation plan um, and what bits were uh, time intensive for you. Um, thanks for that, um, Christabel, who intimately knows the challenges of that <laughs> process because she was involved with it. Um, I think the the time frame, and I actually wasn't even sure it was only eight months. I think it could have been a little bit longer than that. Um, the but the time frame was necessary because um, I think partly because we're working across agencies and not necessarily with the evaluation experts within those agencies. So there's this educational piece of work, um, including for myself, about what is a monitoring and evaluation plan. What's it for? And what does it look like? And why do we need it? Um, so that took time and then of course um, adapting the, the um, toolkit to our circumstances was challenging because and we've had these conversations um, because it's not just one project or one program or one initiative but it's multi um, multi programs multi agencies multi um, time frames so um, that took a while for us to get our heads around and work out how to how to adapt it properly um, and then, of course, anyone who works in government will understand this, approvals processes, because it's one thing to have approvals from each um, program area, then from each agency, but to have cross-agency approval um, is always a very um, long process. So that took quite a lot of time. I'd probably just add that <clears throat> for me uh, in, in the role I was playing, it was kind of 
fortunate that it was taking a bit of time because there was a parallel project of going on and that was mm. evaluating action plan one. <clears throat> so one was informing the other all the way through, which was just a sort of, you know, related to the timing. Um, <clears throat> but it was a really sort of useful uh, that there was that extended period to to uh, reflect on some of the le learning that was formally coming out of the evaluation as we fed into the process of developing the the, fra the monitoring and uh, evaluation and accountability plan in particular. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, Christine Short from NT Health um, has got a couple of questions. One I think you might have answered, which was around um, whether there'll be an annual report or evaluation. You talked about doing, um, after she typed in the question, that you talked about doing the annual report for the minister. And the intention for that is to be published, is that right? Yeah, that will be published. Um, but as um, Peter talked about, there are a whole lot of component evaluations um, yeah. for different uh, projects under Action Plan 2, um, most of which will be published. Some of those, some some of that decision making is up to the individual agencies, but we're encouraging sharing of those results. Um, and wherever we can, that will be incorporated into the annual report as well. And I think the, um, uh, the office or the division has sort of always had a uh, have placed an emphasis on making visible the outcomes of and the status of um, the action plans as they progress. And um, action plan one had kind of annual releases onto the website, the same website that these documents are publicly available on. Um, and that will be the same for um, action plan two. And Christine also has another question around um, the subsidiary program. So the ones that sit underneath your overarching framework, um, whether you expect the other agencies to mirror the overall program logic or just pick out the outcomes that they're meant to achieve in their pro project and just use the standard um, program evaluation framework. So just wondering what sort of guidance or expectations there are for those subsidiary programs. Well, as much as possible, we want them to mirror. Um, and so as part of that development of the project plans that we talked about, we provided a example of how they might um, develop their program logic in a way that was aligned with the MEEP. Um, and yeah, look, as I said, we're in early stages now, so seeing how that's going, but um, in, if, from my opinion, if they're not aligned with the MEEP, it's going to make it very difficult for us to be able to gather up the subsidiary project outcomes in an evaluation of the um, action plan as a whole. Yep. Um, we've got a question from Sarah Smithhurst. Uh, she says she's curious about how you found the engagement from agencies and other stakeholders in the evaluation process so far and what barriers or challenges you've come across. I suppose, I mean, one of the barriers and challenges, as I said, is about resources. So um, I think everyone agrees that monitoring and evaluation and accountability is important, um, but not everybody has the resources or the understanding um, to be able to devote the time to it that's required. And particularly, um, you know, working across these agencies where everybody is so busy and there is so much frontline work going on. Um, sometimes this can be seen as sort of back-end bureaucratic work and it's not necessarily prioritised. Mm -hmm. um, so having to convince people about why this is important and um, why in the long run it's, it's um, beneficial for us to be able to show these outcomes um, for the frontline work as well, I think is part of it. Um, and I think one of the other challenges is around um, trying to achieve consistency, but also understanding everyone's different um, ways of working and different contexts. I mean, you're talking about police context compared to health context, compared to Attorney General and Justice. It's very, very different. Um, so trying to get some consistency across that in a way that works for those agencies, but also works for us to be able to pull it all together, I think was challenging. 
Um, I'll just add, Christabel, that um, one of the findings out of the uh, review of Action Plan 1 was that sort of right at the beginning of the establishment of that, that um, a lot of agencies um, felt rushed um, and um, uh, didn't, I guess, there wasn't this sort of systematic approach to um, creating the ac the actions and the commitments and, their and the work plans that sat behind that. Um, mm -hmm. So what we found as the years went on with Action Plan 1 is that agent, um, partnering agencies um, ha had a degree of frustration, as we did internally within mm -hmm. Territory Families, about the nature of some of those commitments, that they were too loose, too broad, too tight, um, too business as usual, too, too this, too that, um, that they weren't really reform type, not necessarily all of them reform um, based uh, actions. Um, the engagement of agencies in the development of this one has been um, rightly so extensive and over, over that time frame we talked about. And that has enabled some really solid thinking that will pay dividends, I guess, both for the framework, but also for the agencies as they progress through this sort of responsibility for reporting, monitoring, uh, evaluation, um, there'll hopefully be less of, oh, gee, why did we have that action in there? Yes, that's right. And that's where it's so important to bring in those learnings from uh, that review of Action Plan 1 um, to, to try to nip that in the bud for the next one. So, it, it, yeah, it is, it's really good you've been able to do that. We have another question from Emily Yu. How often will you review and update the MEEP to ensure it is relevant and responds to the changed context? So you mentioned before about updating it uh, when Action Plan 3 comes along, but are you envisaging updating it before then, perhaps with some of the new data that might come through? Uh, yes, um, it's uh, it doesn't actually state that in the MEEP itself, but um, it, it's just an omission that um, it wasn't on the list of updating itself. Um, it is, it is uh, as data becomes available, I mean, there is this sort of annual cycle that um, Anna's just referred to, so I would expect as a minimum annually, it will have all of the year's work um, reflected back into it um, and coming out of the various, I don't know, the, the new tools that are data capture tools as well as the, the evaluations that deliver um, findings for us. So annually would be my pitch. Very good. Um, there's lots of thank you messages in the chat and a question uh, whether you would be willing to share your slides after this. Is that something you might be willing to do? Sure. Yeah. They're pretty messy. We're happy to share. <laughs> we can tidy, tidy slides. We'll share tidy slides. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think that looks like it for the questions. Thank you both so much for your time. I would love